new psychological study from the National Institute of Mental Health. Just this morning, along this long time cycle, the circle of depression is growing wider, broader. 15% of women suffer from this disorder. Abnormalities in the neurotransmitters. Six million American kids take prescribed medication. But what if the criminal is mentally ill? The punishment, a form of aversion therapy. Oppositional defiance disorder. Schools criticized for overprescription. Everywhere you look, there it is. Think psychiatry has nothing to do with you? Think again. The whole field of psychiatry has gotten into every facet of your life. They basically believe that everyone is mentally ill. You smoke too much, it's a disease. You're too unhappy, it's a disease. You're too thin, it's a disease. You're too fat, it's a disease. Where are these coming from? These are coming from the minds of psychiatrists that are dreaming these things up writing papers and, get, and getting published with their names on it, calling, creating these new diseases. First he said that I had ADD. Then he said that I was depressed. Then he said I might be bipolar, but I don't have ADD anymore. And he said, you know, I've been noticing you, and I, I wonder if you have it too. What they decided is that both my husband and my son had a chemical imbalance. It needed to be corrected with a chemical balancer. There is not one shred of credible evidence that any respectable scientist would consider valid demonstrating that anything that psychiatrists call mental illness are brain diseases or biochemical imbalances. It's all fraud. There is no reliability of diagnosis and there is no science. It's just pseudoscience. It's pretend science. This is one of the most open secrets in all of America in the psychiatric field that nothing, nothing, is being done that's legitimate, and they're billing for it. Psychiatrists claim that over one billion of the world's population is mentally ill. In the past 30 years, they have prescribed psychiatric medications to 543 million people. And right now, they drug 17 million school children with stimulants and antidepressants. When recently asked about the scientific basis of their yeah, profession, yeah. those psychiatrists willing to be interviewed offered no nothing but excuses. Psychiatric uh, uh, illness is, uh, is not really an uh, illness. How do you uh, evaluate if someone is cured or, or sick? Cure is certainly something we look forward to and we had no earthly idea how to accomplish. We're not good at causes. We don't know what causes mental illness. But that hasn't stopped them from pronouncing themselves mental health experts and treating people against their will. And the results? This psychiatrist, man who's supposed to work to heal people, has done nothing but destroy this man's life, and in destroying his life, destroying the lives of all of his loved ones. Excuse me. They've damaged and ruined my son, and they've trapped him in a system. The way that they treated him and made him feel like he was worthless. Ryan was being kept dumb and, and high on Ritalin so that they could make $2,500 per month. He gave me Valium, and um, I got addicted to it. It wiped out my life. My life has been ruined. Uh, my joy has been stolen. She was laying there. She took two, two gasps of air and died right there in front of me. It is really tragic. It's awful. And it's being done for money. That's why it's being done. Oh, it's got to be in the billions. I don't know the exact number, but it's got to be in the billions. It's, it's just unbelievable. This is so big that it's, it boggles the mind. Take the human tragedy you have just seen and multiply it by the millions. In the past four decades, nearly twice as many Americans have died in government psychiatric hospitals than in all U.S. wars since 1776. Insurance companies pay out $69 billion every year for psychiatric services, doubling the cost of medical insurance premiums. And while raking in over $2 trillion annually, psychiatrists cannot point to a single cure. 
Hard to believe? That's exactly what they count on. And as we will show you, it's how they have been getting away with it from the very beginning. The roots of psychiatry have to do with control, power, and alienation from certain groups of people who were uncomfortable to be around. They were locked up in these places to get them out of the way. Uh, the history of psychiatry, I think, really is related to institutions. Bethlehem Royal Hospital in London was one of the world's first psychiatric institutions. Commonly referred to as Bedlam, the hospital was little more than a warehouse for those deep mad. Inmates were confined to cages, closets, and animal stalls, chained to walls, and flogged, while the asylum charged admission for public viewings. In the 18th century, William Batty was the first to promote that his institutions could cure the mentally ill. Batty's madhouses made him one of the richest men in England, though his treatments were every bit as inhumane as those practiced in Bedlam with not a single patient cured. His financial success triggered a boom in the asylum business and an opportunity for psychiatrists to cash in on this new growth industry. This was an era where on both sides of the Atlantic specialized institutions for the mentally ill are beginning to be built in large numbers. Those institutions date back certainly to the beginning of the 18th century and in a few cases even earlier than that uh, but the explosive growth of an asylum sector of asylumdom as some historians have called it is very much a, a 19th century phenomenon uh, it's that period when the state is persuaded to invest tax dollars in building these places but while those who ran the institutions were getting rich psychiatrists yet lacked the credibility to maximize their cash flow. In order to justify their profession, they needed to come up with these biological solutions, or they didn't, didn't have any profession. The only way for them to solve that was to attempt to start uh, believing that, that these people that were suffering from emotional disorders was from, from a biological basis. Whatever was done to make this person more manageable would be simply called a treatment. And the sad reality is that many of these so-called treatments were in essence torture. The near drowning devices that were developed in this period, for example, must have been appallingly frightening. For example, one device involved putting the patient into a coffin, closing the lid and dumping it into a bath of water. and then opening it up and trying to revive the patient. But there were a range of these things and the mortality rate was, was very, very high. Psychiatrists next sought to give credence to their practices by cloaking them in the language of medicine. This repackaging of treatment became known as the medical model. Well, somebody who's really hyper and manic, uh, if you're wrapped up in a cold sheet and dunked into some water, you're going to quit acting manic because that's a punishing uh, treatment. So, but as soon as the symptoms started to go away, they started to believe that somehow by wrapping them up and dunking them in cold water, it was um, draining the toxics out of their body. So they built the medical model around that. Pushing the biological theory of mental illness a step further, an American, Benjamin Rush, put forth the idea that insanity was caused by too much blood in the head. The cure? Remove the blood by any means possible. Restraint, cold water, bleeding, even terror. And with that, a new medical model was created. Benjamin Rush was probably the most famous American physician of the revolutionary era. Uh, Rush was known as the master bleeder. He bled his patients for madness. He also invented something called the tranquilizer. It's a chair that looks a little bit like an electric chair. The patient